So today we're going to continue on in the Fruits of the Spirit series. Uh, this is maybe our fifth message in the series, I think. And so I would encourage you to go back and listen to the other messages because they all build upon one another. But today we're going to talk about love and peace. Yeah, no big deal, right? Love and peace, giant topics. And so we're going to try to lump them together in one message. So just prepare yourselves. So love, I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot. It, there's a lot to say about both, um, and so it was even more challenging during the first service, but um, the whole series has been challenging to not just keep bringing it all back to love every time because every fruit comes from love. So if you think about all the fruits of the Spirit, love, well, gentleness, kindness, self-control, what are they? I'm going blank. All the fruits. They all come, patience. patience, they all come, why do I keep forgetting that one? I don't know. <laughs> when we did that video, I forgot that one. It's funny how I keep forgetting that one. Anyway, um, so they all come from love. And so when we, we really, there's a lot of definitions for love. People describe love differently, but I wanted to come to the main definition of love that we can find in the Bible, which is God himself is love. And that's why we base this whole series on to know him is the main pursuit. And then from knowing him, you become like him. You naturally become gentle and kind and patient. You can't force yourself to be those things. You should make some effort. You shouldn't try, not even care, but you can't self-will it. So if God is love, to know him is to know love. And so one way to really fully understand who he is, his nature, is to replace the word love in the famous love scripture, which is 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. If we were to, I'm going to read it with God in, in the place of love. Um, God suffers long and he is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade himself. He's not puffed up. He does not behave rudely. He does not seek his own. He is not provoked. He does not, he's, he is not evil. He does not rejoice in iniquity, but he rejoices in the truth. He bears all things. He believes all things. He hopes all things, and he endures all things. It's really eye-opening to think about love, not so much as some behavior we need to attain, but as God himself. And if you really reflect on that scripture, it really helps you to understand who he is, how is he as a father. And so, again, when we pursue love, it really means we're pursuing him. And then we naturally become like him. And so here I go again on the telling on myself thing. But uh, most of my life, I've struggled with the fear of, well, we talked about this, guys. I don't know if you were with us when I picked on David a lot about how he didn't seem to have a conscience when he was born. Do y'all remember that? No? <laughs> so I was born with a giant conscience, always wanting to be good, always wanting to do the right thing. I don't know what happened with David. But he, he really caught up. He really caught up. So thank goodness for the Lord. <clears throat> not, not to say that I was better than him. I want to say that. I wasn't better than him, but I did. <laughs> it sounds like I'm saying I was so much better than him. Um, Don't get yourself in trouble now. Amber. I'm not worried about it. Um, <laughs> Um, I, it was for the wrong reasons. It was right and wrong, and it was for measuring up, and I don't want God to be mad at me. It was it through, and I had shame and all the things. So still there's this lingering, shameful feeling of like, if you're not, if I'm not being so loving towards my kids or to someone, or if I don't seem to have grace for somebody, it's like kind of hard to have grace for everybody. I mean, I know we're, y'all are lovely, but um, some people are just kind of, you know, harder to love. And so I would beat myself up for like, I can't seem to love these people. Um, and I would have this subtle feeling of like, whenever thinking about whenever I die and when I see Jesus face to face. I don't know if anybody else has this. This is a recurring thought in my mind. And I would be constantly picturing myself needing to answer to him. And and every time that I fail at all of these things, like I'm not loving enough, I'm not gentle enough, I'm not kind enough, or I'm not doing enough for him. 
that's a big one. That's my thing. That's a big one for me is I'm not doing enough for him. And, you know, because, you know, missionaries are doing more or someone that's, a, you know, someone that's doing more. It's just never enough in my mind. So I would constantly feel like a dread almost thinking about answering to the Lord. And that is so far from the reality we should be living. And I just want to touch on that. So 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, which is dread. Dread does not exist. But perfect, complete, full love drives out fear because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment. So the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love, has not grown in sufficient understanding of God's love. So there's our answer. If we're walking in that feeling of never measuring up and having a, almost a dread as to, is it going to be enough when I see him? Is he going to say, well done and faithful, you faithful servant? If this is like, of course we want to hear that. We should long to hear that. But we shouldn't be so dreadful and fearful that we're not enough for him. Because then that just shows us, okay, where did I miss? I must not fully understand his perfect love. I must not understand how he loves me. Okay, so I'm totally different than Amber. I never think that. How do you go through life? (laughs) You see what I mean? He doesn't think. I never have those thoughts, but I do know it's a real thing. And part of it is that a long time ago, I had this thought, if I could ask the Lord any question, let's say God appeared in person, like stood right in front of you. And if I could, if you could ask him any question, what would you ask him? And for me, I knew my answer at the time was, Lord, how do you feel about me right now? Because I wanted his embrace. I wanted his hug. I wanted his affection. And I learned early on just how perfect his love was for me. It was my response to it and how I was treating others that I struggled with. But I learned early on that God loved me unconditionally. And so I know there are people that struggle in feeling like you're not measuring up, you're not doing enough, and when the end comes, God's going to hold you accountable and he's going to tell you all the wrong things you did and all the issues that you had. But I don't believe that. I believe that when you're born again... Yes, we'll receive for the things that we've done, but I believe there's a different kind of judgment for those that are born again, different than the world. I believe the world that rejects him will face a different kind of judgment than what we will face. But still, there can be this continuous feeling that you're not doing enough, or you're not measuring up, or you're not performing. And I was a very performance-driven person. However, God dealt with that, and you need to let God deal with that in you. Okay, because the problem is when you're performance driven and you feel like you have to measure up, where does it end? When are you good enough? When have you done enough? When do you, when do you finally get to feel like you're satisfied in your work? So God wants you to find a rest and he, he makes sure that you understand you're not saved by your works. You're only saved by his grace. That's the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is that you could never save yourself, so he gave you himself. That's the essence of the fruit of the spirit. You will never be able to love properly without him inside of you, teaching and guiding and showing you how to love. Only the Holy Spirit can show you how to properly love. You'll never be able to do it on your own, ever. You'll never be able to see properly and love right and live right or do any of these things in the fruit of the Spirit, like self-control, which I talked about last week. If I think I can behavior modify to self-control myself, it's just a matter of time before I'll circumvent the systems that I put in place, right? So... The beauty of the gospel and the the essence of grace is that God's divine favor and influence is is on your life to help you to become. Love becomes you. Love becomes you. And when you give your life to Jesus and you get born again and the Holy Spirit's inside of you, then the Holy Spirit is way bigger than your issues and yourself. You just have to learn to die to yourself by trusting and surrendering continuously and daily to him. And so... In the context of fear, I want to say this, any fear that you have in your life, any fear is an absence of perfect love. The only healthy fear is the fear of God. And I've did a whole series on the fear of God. So if you don't know what the fear of God is, go back into our podcast or YouTube and listen to those. But I I want to reiterate this to you. Any area that you are afraid is an absence of perfect love. 
because the scripture says, perfect love drives out or casts out all fear. So whether it's end time judgment or whether it's sickness, car accidents, your children, your marriage, your finances, any of those areas, if you fall into fear, is an absence of perfect love. So ask yourself, where am I afraid and what am I afraid of? This is one of the first places to start. Lord, show me the areas in my heart that I have fear because fear often leads to shame and often leads to control. And the control is I hide myself, I protect myself because you don't wanna really see the real me, so I'm gonna hide me. That's, the root of that is always fear. But God says step into the light because the light crucifies fear. But fear always brings hiding. It always brings pretending. And that's why I tell you, don't fake it till you make it. Cry your eyes out, ball and manifest. I'd rather you be like that. I tell, there's like, I've had people cuss me out to my face while I just smile and say, are you done? Get it all out. It's okay. And you're like, well, they're being disrespectful. Look, I'd rather them be honest than lie to my face, right? I can handle it. God can handle it. 32 of the Psalms are open complaints to God. He already knows you anyway, just as you are. So he can handle your complaints. He can handle your struggles. He just wants to get intimate with you and he wants to drive out these fears and reveal his perfect love. So God is always for you and he's always fighting on your behalf. The Bible says he'll never leave you or forsake you. Hence, you never actually need to be afraid because his love is perfect and he's always reaching, longing, and demonstrating his love to you. All you need to do is abide. So that God's answer was abide, 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 abide. But in, we're in a world of distraction. Right now, some of you are distracted. You're thinking about your friends, your food, your family. You're thinking about, I don't even know what we're thinking about, right? We come into church in our mind or we go to get with the Lord. Like in the prayer and fasting guide, I instructed everybody, if you have struggle getting alone with the Lord quietly and thoughts keep coming to your mind, write them down and deal with them after. You know, I'll get together with the Lord for an hour and every 10 minutes, something's coming to my mind. I write it down and I deal with it later. But we're in a world of distraction. So God says, look, if you want to know my perfect love and who I am, you must abide, 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 and abide together with him. So when God reveals to you where you're lacking perfect love or you have fear, ask him to show you how he feels about that situation and about you in that time. Yeah, like I'll just tell myself again, one of the fears I had to overcome years ago is the fear of death. Um, I had a season where I was having really bad asthma. I've told y'all about this. So I've always had it my whole life, but it flared up later in age and it's harder when you're older, I feel like. Um, and I couldn't breathe, couldn't breathe. So it put me into a spin of like panic attacks and um, couldn't get past it. So finally, um, I think I, the Lord just getting alone with him, abiding with him, just staying connected to him, revealed to me that the root, the root cause really is of my anxiety was a fear of death. And a lot of us have this fear that we might die. And, and for me, before the whole uh, breathing thing, I had that fear before I had the breathing problem. It was revealed to me when I had the breathing problem because I don't know about you guys. I don't know if this is a mom thing in general, but I always had this subconscious thing that maybe I might die early and I might not get to see my kids get old enough. I don't know. I think it's the enemy. And I would just, it was so, he is so, so awful. Like just thinking back about how I took some of those thoughts, his lies that he creeped in my mind as just, okay, like, and just didn't. Didn't push them away, just kind of accepted them. I remember putting my kids to bed like years ago and having this subtle thought of like, you won't have many more of these times with them. How, how awful. And I just like, okay, you know, just kind of like, I really, I, you just kind of accept it. And I think, I hope I, I hope I don't, you know, but there was this subtle thing. Fast forward, you know, over a year later and I can't breathe. And then it really comes to light. Like I have a real full blown belief that I might die. And then I was anxious and, and the whole root of anxiety really is control and fear. Um, and so all that to say, the only way I got out of that and that I found his perfect love is by coming back to him and getting desperate, like my first message, seeking him, getting desperate to be like, okay, Lord, I can't live this way. I will like, if I'm going to be alive, I'm going to be fully living. I'm not going to be worried about dying while I'm alive. I might as well be dead. 
just me. So I just came to a conclusion like, Lord, I'm going to believe that you love me and that you're good and that no matter what, all things are going to work together for good. So 1 John 4, 16 through 17 says, God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides continually in him. In this union and fellowship with him, love is completed and perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment with assurance and boldness to face him because as he is, so are we. So it's saying to abide. And John 15 talks about literally, he is the, we are the vine, he is the branch, vice versa. All right, no. Oh, I said it right. Branches, okay, yeah. I said it right. So when we're disconnected, like if you were to just snap off the, the branch, like we literally, he's no longer our source. He's, we are disconnected. So in a real practical sense for some of y'all that like that, abiding is a fancy word for saying, just be in relationship with him. Stay in constant conversation with him. So when I'm facing fear and I'm, a, I'm feeling like I'm not measuring up, where, wherever I, perfect love is absent, it's going and seeking him and having quiet time and asking him, what do you think about this? Show me your nature. Show me who you are. Show me what you're doing through me in this situation. And that's what transforms us out of those hard situations. So I just want to encourage you guys, ask the Lord a lot of questions, but then listen right? So a lot of people, when I ask them about, tell me about your prayer life. And they're like, well, I petition the Lord for this, or I have people on my prayer list, and I'm praying for this, and I'm praying for that, and I'm praying for this, and I'm talking to the Lord, and I'm praying for these things. I said, well, you're kind of only halfway praying because you're not really listening. As you get a little older and walk with the Lord more, you actually learn to trust and listen and abide by resting because God already knows what you need if you'll just listen, and the challenge, again, is that's why we can't be, allow ourselves to be so distracted all the time. And we have to, especially with our phones and entertainment and TV and the world. So I just encourage you guys, sit and listen. The more that you abide, the more that, that you will discover. The more you divide, abide, the more you'll discover. I also want to tell you guys that even though we may dis disconnect from him like she just talked about, he never disconnects from you. Remember that. Even if you disconnect from him, he doesn't disconnect from you. We're the ones that walk away. He never walks away. I'm talking to those of you that have given your life to Jesus. So here in a minute, we're going to talk about peace and how love leads to peace. And I'm going to share this awesome little scripture for you. It wasn't in our notes, but it's uh, Ephesians 2.14. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, it talks about how he is our peace because there's no more wall of separation. The wall of separation has come down. Well, what was the wall? The wall was the law. And the law always brings condemnation and shame. Look at this scripture. It's so powerful. So because of what Jesus did on the cross, again, the beautiful understanding of the gospel is that he tore down the true veil and now you have full-time access. And it goes on to say that you actually have access for help in the time of need at all times. So you can have peace because of his perfect love where he gave his life on the cross, and now I'm not separated. You may feel separated, or you may have walked away, but the good news is he's always standing there with his arms wide open, waiting for you to come back home. Now, the question is, do you really believe that? And I'm gonna challenge you with another question. Do you really understand the beauty of the gospel? Do you really understand the freedom that you've been given? Do you really understand the power of the blood? Do you really understand why he had to tear this wall down by giving his life and tearing his body? Do you really understand that religion has a veil, but there's no presence behind it? God doesn't want you to be religious. When the veil was ripped in two, there was no ark behind it. So it's a facade. Don't fall prey to the Sunday morning facades and don't just live Sunday to Sunday. Live every day in his presence. You don't want to have a form of godliness, but have no power. And so the beauty of this scripture is God tore down the separation. Even if I feel separated, it's a lie. And sometimes I feel, and many times I've said this to you, I separated myself. We say, oh, I fell into sin. You didn't fall, brother. You did a double, triple, perfect backflip dive with no splash in the pool. Ten. <laughs> But guess, guess what? Guess what? God was still there. 
Isn't that amazing? Can you even fathom the greatness of God's love that despite how many times we went astray, and if you go astray again, he'll still be there? Now, we don't like that in the natural because you should be punished for that. But there was a wall, and that punishment was resolved on the cross. Because I can look at, look, if I ask God to turn on my prophetic hat, I could probably call some of you out on some secret shady stuff y'all got going on privately. <laughs> some stuff I don't even want to say because I don't, I don't, last thing I want to do is shame you. So God brings perfect love, which does what? Covers a multitude of sins. So can you imagine there's probably a multitude of sins in this room right now? You're covered. Because God loves you and I love you. We love you. Because we all deserve death. Think about the prostitute that came and poured her dowry of $250,000 worth of spike nard on Jesus' head and feet and then washed his feet with her hair. She was a prostitute. Her actions alone demonstrated repentance. And then the Lord forgave her. And then she loved so much because of that forgiveness. So how do you know God loves you? You can give me a good Sunday school answer. He died on the cross. What does that even mean? Or you can have an encounter with perfect love and understand that God continuously forgives and loves and has grace. Every one of us needs forgiveness in this room. I don't need it any, any less than you do. So there's no shame here. We're all in desperate need. And because of God's perfect love, guess what? I love so stinking much. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. So we often feel like we're not able to love God well enough. I do. And so I feel like I've wanted to force myself to love him and show my love. But I love Bill Johnson's quote. It says, you can't make yourself love God with all of your being, but you can choose to receive his love until that's the only logical response. And so it made me really think about marriage. And this is David's favorite part about the whole message because I'm going to talk nicely about him. Uh, so words of affirmation, my number one love language. Let me see if I can get it together. Okay. <clears throat> so if I'm thinking about marriage, when I was thinking about how can I put this in like normal, like everyday terms for us to fully understand God's love for us. And I honestly thought of our marriage and I thought of how over the years he has been I made it through the first service without crying, so I didn't think I needed tissues. I'm going to do this. Um, it's okay to cry. He, I know, but I can't get my words when I'm crying. I need That's my okay words. Too. No, no, too many. I'm only going to need <coughs> one, maybe. Okay. I think about over the years about how he's not perfect, but he's loved me really well. And... So kind and patient and gentle and not pushy and his faithfulness to me and the way he loves me has made me want to have a natural response to love him back. And it's a perfect reflection of, and marriage, by the way, is supposed to be a perfect reflection of how Christ loves the bride and the church and, the church and how he gave his life for us. And so I will say David does that really well for the most part. And I feel like will be <laughs> because he has loved me so well and has shown me the love, the father's love, like his nature, he exhibits the father's nature. It has made me really fully understand how much the father loves me, if that makes any sense. And we can't know that without union and doing life. We've done 
lots of life together at 11 years, and you think about doing, going through all the hard times that we've been through. Um, and the only way we can have that connection and know, and that I can know that love and everything is through doing life and being in un union. So I think about how much that is similar to the Father and how we have to like make him priority and that has to be a, a main relationship to get to know him just like I know my husband as gentle as loving as and and when we get to know him through devoting our time and our passion and our effort and we seek him first we are encouraged and empowered to be different so for example because he loves me so well I feel like I can do things that I don't think I would have tried doing without him that makes any sense. Like you speaking today. Or like me speaking or like me doing anything because he's always encouraging me. You should be really happy right now. <laughs> Why do I want to kiss you right now? Ah. You this know is what? why I don't encourage him. Oh, he's out of control. Out of control. You, you, you knew it was coming. You knew, Jordan. You knew it was coming. If I'm ever encouraging to him, he's out of control. <sighs> anyway, bring it home that marriage should reflect how the Father <coughs> is with us. And it comes through deep relationship and surrender and submission in marriage. So... <clears throat> There's a lot to say in the context of marriage, and I know we are going to do another marriage series at some point and just talk about marriage. We know that marriage is under massive attack. We know that the divorce rate's insane, and we know that even in the church and even here, marriage is struggle. We know that. And so I'll just say a couple things about what she said, and that was very nice of you, and thank you. Uh, it wasn't always that way. No, I left that, that part way. out. I, I was know, really... But I'll tell on myself. So it wasn't always that way because I really struggled with Amber not meeting my needs or not doing the things that I wanted her to do for me. Um, Amber wasn't raised with words of affirmation. She wasn't raised to be encouraging. It's not a natural thing for her. Her top love language is not words of affirmation, right? It's clearly acts of service. And so... Um, <laughs> Just get it Which, all without out. Without words of affirmation, I struggle serving, right? So uh, there's a whole thing there. So One I have th a long list. Basically, I have a long list for you. I know, you yeah. But let me say that. Remember this in this context. There's five love languages that we, that, and I love the five love languages, understanding. God speaks them all. He's, he's words of affirmation. He's acts of service. He's physical touch. He's quality time, and he gives gifts. So she's never going to be able to meet all my needs and vice versa. Only the Lord is 100% of what you need. And when you, when, if you always look to be happier to get your needs met from your spouse, again, when will you be satisfied? When is enough enough, right? And so the Lord is always more than enough and he's too good. So what happened was the more that I would put pressure on Amber to become something I want her to become, the more that she would push back and not become that thing. So, so the answer was that God was looking at me in my response of dying to myself and laying my life down for her, no matter how she was or she wasn't. But early on, I would manifest, I'd get selfish. And trust me, I still have some of my moments and she has moments too. We're completely opposite. Opposites attract or opposites attack. And sometimes we really attack but there's a lot more attraction, right? And so for me, I knew that God was looking at me. I discovered that when Adam and Eve ate from the tr wrong tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this is really for the men. When Adam and Eve ate, Eve ate first, but Adam still ate. And God held Adam accountable for the two. Even though they both ate, who did God look at? So when Jesus gave his life for the bride, which is all of us here, the bride was really jacked up and really messed up and really broken and really weak. So Jesus' response was to lay his life down for us. That was, the perfect dem that was a demonstration of complete and perfect love. Once I got that revelation, I said, okay, I'm going to 
do the very best that I can to reflect and be like Jesus to my wife, no matter how she acts, no matter how she manifests, no matter whether she gives me what I want or not, no matter if she does what I think she should do or not. And it's tough, it's hard, but you have to learn to find your complete source in the Lord. And so in Ephesians 5, we get the understanding. I keep harping this, but this is so important. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her through the washing of the water of the word. So it doesn't mean that I'm quoting scripture and whatever she's manifesting or having that issues. That would be really not good. That would push her away even more. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. Get away from me with that. Right. <laughs> but instead, I become the word in flesh to her. So I'm still bringing the word to her, but I become it. I'm living it. I'm, I become the essence of it, right? And so in turn, that washes and cleanses her and produces life. And then it goes on to say that he might present her to himself. Well, I'm not presenting my wife to me. Who am I presenting my wife to? Because I can assure you, man, when your wife's manifest and not acting right, we're probably not praying for her. But I pray for my wife and I, I call out to Jesus for her and I ask the Lord to do what God wants to do. And then he says, okay, well, are you going to do what I've called you to do? And I say, I'll give it all I got. He says, well, lay your life down and love no matter what. And so I've had my fair share of not doing things right. But over the course of time, what I want to really do is be like Jesus. I have no greater desire in my life. Listen, money, coffee shops, stuff, it all is going to fade away. You can get the newest, latest, greatest, in a few years it's going to fade away. Our bodies are fading. Everything's fading. Everything's in decay. Now, that's not negative, Nancy, bad news, just push the button now. But it's in the Bible. Everything's in decay. It's in, everything's in decay. So the beautiful news is we don't hang on to anything and find our value in anything but in him because his perfect love makes you new every single day. And he renews things every single day. So I'm just going to say this real quick about being one flesh. When you get married and you're joined together with your spouse, Biblically, it says you become one flesh, but the problem is you'll only become one flesh if each spouse over the course of time lays their lives down and you unite truly together without being defensive and fighting and selfish. One flesh, though it happens in covenant, it takes time to discover, right? Our first year to a marriage was complete manifesting. We would say things like, you probably married the wrong person, or she would say to me, you should have married somebody more spiritual than me right? And then I would put pressure on her and then she would put pressure on me. And then we would just go back and forth. And then for, there were so many times we thought, man, we must've made mistakes. It's not working out. We married the wrong person, which were all lies of the devil, right? Now I know some of you are here and one spouse has gone sideways. I get that because it does take two. It takes two to lay their lives down for one another. But I'm speaking to any of the men that I have here. God's looking at you. Okay, God's looking at you. And for the women that have had men or husbands that have gone sideways, you make Jesus your first love because he'll never fail you. When you're single. Especially when you're single. I, and Jesus is my first love because she'll fail me. I'll fail her. We're never going to be enough. But Jesus is always more than enough. Do you understand that, singles? If you're divorced or your spouse has gone sideways, Jesus is everything that you need. And you keep your eyes on him and he'll bring true peace. Because if I look to her as my source of happiness, we're going to have problems or vice versa. He is our source. Amen? Okay. All right. So we'll look at the, the one, the main commandment. Because one of the greatest works of the Spirit is to help us to live by the first commandment, which is Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 through 39. And Jesus replied to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. You should love your neighbor um, as yourself. That is, un unselfishly seek the best of the higher good for others. Um, and so loving God requires something from us. It's not just sentimental feelings or attending church or a worship service. In, in John 14, 21, it says, a person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who really loves me. 
And whoever really loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him, meaning I will make myself real to him. And so we don't always measure up, but the main thing you should be asking the Lord to, to obey is the first commandment. So you want to you wanna be prove your love, show your love, not prove, show your love to the Lord by obeying him. Well, what can you simply obey? The first commandment, love him with everything. That's it. Love him with your mind, soul, everything. And so if you have that right, you are loving him. And so we're going to mess up and we have the Holy Spirit to help us. It's not saying like if you fail, then you're not showing love. It's saying that if you have a heart to obey him, if you have a heart to make him first and you keep asking for help, you keep seeking him first, that's all he asks from you. Because it's more than a feeling. <laughs> Love. Come on, boss. Where's my Boston fans at? <laughs> Love is more than a feeling. It's an action. Actions lead to feelings. The challenge is, is we were raised with Disney princess movies and fairy tale movies, and we got dysfunctional pornography that's teaching kids all the wrong things about what love is. And it's just so completely jacked up the world that we were raised in. If you were raised the way that I was raised in, I was raised in a world where it was have a girlfriend or a boyfriend by the time I was you know, 11 or 12, and I lost my virginity at 14. And then my whole childhood was all about the feelings of love and the next person and the next person and the next person. And it created this promiscuous lifestyle. I have such a hatred for that now because I wish I never would have gone that route. And I wish you wouldn't have either. And I don't want you to go that route because the pain and the heartbreak and the dysfunction that comes with it is devastating. But God can heal it. But I want to say we live in a culture that grooms contrary to the kingdom of God. Love is an action. And so I don't, you've got to get to the spot where it's with the Lord. You move past the whole feeling of love. God loves you. He's for you. He's not against you even when I don't feel it. Because there are many days I'm like, God, where are you? I don't feel you. It doesn't change the fact of who he is and how he feels about you, right? Isn't that awesome? And so in marriage, great example. Couples, before they get married, in, their, in the engagement process, they can do no wrong. They're just like, oh, they're the most perfect person ever. Everything's great. They're doing wonderful. A year later, they're scouring on each other at each end of the couch in my office. And it's like, why? Because the very actions that they once did, they stopped doing. And when you remove the actions of love, you remove the feelings of love. But see, God never stops acting because he never stopped act, acting in the sense of act, giving action. He's always forgiving and he's always merciful and he's always kind and he's always there and he never leaves you or forsakes you, which I don't fully understand, but he's that good to always be there when you need him the most. Amen? Amen. So loving God with your mind, I just want to touch on that because I never really fully thought about how you can obey God. Like it's saying, if you love me, you'll obey me. Well, how do we obey God with our mind? I was talking to you about the subtle lies that I was just letting stay in my mind. I wasn't obeying God. I wasn't believing the truth. I wasn't taking every thought captive. So it says to take every thought captive and replace it with truth. So I wasn't doing that. So I just want to emphasize that it's so important to like take your thoughts, the moment you wake up, anything that's not a good thought is not a God thought. Remember what we've said, never, 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 ever, 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 ever let the voice of the devil go unanswered. Which means you need to get a treasure chest of God's word inside of you. I'm gonna say, I keep harping this, some of you know more about your career and your business than you do about God's word. Stop, invest your life to be a student of the word. Get the Bible inside of you fully. Understand God's heart. Understand what his truths are so you have this treasure chest to draw from. You get all the ammo you need for any situation, circumstance that you're facing. And when you know God's word, you're gonna understand who he is and you're gonna understand how he feels about you. And you're gonna have a language and a narrative to talk with him and understand what he's saying about every situation in your life. All right. So let's, we're going to, I do want to say this about love. Here's a great prayer to pray. Ask the Lord for a greater capacity to love him. He doesn't need any more capacity. We do. And so I often say, Lord, 
give me a greater understanding of how much you love me and how to, how to love you. Give me a greater capacity. Like, take the desires. Here's one thing. If you're struggling with addiction, alcoholism, drugs, fear, worry, doubt, whatever your thing is, entertainment, whatever it is, all the stuff I, we've talked about last week in self-control, if you're struggling with those things, ask God to give you new desires and delight yourself in him. So scripturally, we understand that if we delight in the Lord, he gives you new desires. You need a new desire. Say it, I need a new desire. desire. Just own it. You gotta, because I'm telling you right now, I needed the desires of my heart, which was to chase after the things of this world and getting high and drinking and partying and all the stuff I did. She had, she didn't live like that, but I did. I needed, a, I needed new desires. So if you still have a desire to run after the things of this world or the arms of another or to overwork or to whatever it is, delight yourself in the Lord and what will he do? He'll give you the desires of your heart. He'll give you new desires. So love leads to perfect peace. Perfect love leads to perfect peace. Let's say that. Perfect love, perfect love. leads to perfect peace. peace. Now I can tell you, usually whenever we're running to anything outside of him or not abiding with him, it's because we're lacking peace and we're looking to something else that's a quick fix to find it. I just want to check out. It's just a couple drinks or just a, you know, I just got to watch a movie or more TV or there's other stuff I want to say that I, that I know is going on in here that I'm not going to say. But I'm just telling you, when you have perfect peace reigning in your heart and you really understand God's perfect love inside of you, those desires to run to those other things are removed. So we need perfect peace. Isaiah 26.3, in the context of your mind and your thought life, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. So yes, I want you to keep trying and never give up. But I often have people say to me, I keep trying to do the right thing and I just keep failing. I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying. And what I see inside of them is this striving works mentality to keep trying harder. I want to challenge you, instead of trying so hard, start trusting more and start abiding. God will do the work. The Holy Spirit is bigger than you. He's bigger than all your issues. He's not surprised. He's like, it's not some little old bitty tiny Holy Spirit that has no power and he's my little genie in a bottle. The Holy Spirit's not a genie in a bottle. It's not Aladdin. The Holy Spirit has power to transform your life and he knows what you need and he will do it if you cry out for it and ask for it. I promise you, he will do it. Some of you are a little more hard-headed and it takes a little longer. But but stay the course and don't give up and keep asking the Holy Spirit to reveal himself and to give you the power to overcome. And so he'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you. And I just wanna talk about this word stayed real quick. Look at the scripture on the screen whose mind, thought life, is stayed upon him. The word stayed is synonymous with the word abide. And here's what it means. It means to lean, lay, rest, be supported by, and to be upheld. It means to lean, embrace yourself against, which sustains you, refreshes you, and revives you. So the more that I lean on him, the more that I let him uphold me, The more that I lay against him or rest against him, what happens? I stay sustained, refreshed, and revived. You know, this Christian life is not supposed to be a barely make it, dull drum, miserable, sad life. But how many Christians make it that way? We just live this life of I'm just barely hanging on and I hope God forgives me and I'll drag myself to church and God's not done care and or he cares, but I'm just never good enough. Guys, the Christian life is supposed to be animated, full of fire and life and joy and vigorous. And you know where that comes from? Not because of anything I do, but because of what he does. If I'm fired up because I've been really good and didn't sin last week, there's a problem. You don't get to be fired up just because you've been good, because you're never gonna be good enough. That's the dysfunction of religion. Here's what real fired up is. I got a cross, I've got a savior, I've got his blood, and I've got a mediator who's always crying out and I've got a perfect love and the wall's been torn down and I always have access and he's always there because I'm part of the household of God. 
I'm in his house now. I'm part of his family. So even no matter what I do, God, I'm still part of his family. And some of y'all religious spirits aren't gonna like that. But I'm just gonna tell you right now, having done a lot of contrary things to his design, he took me back every time. <laughs> every single time. And we'll take you back every time. Unless you're cancerous, like super toxic. And just, just eating, destroying people's lives here. But in general, we'll take you back every time because he, he takes you back every time. That's the glory of the gospel. The glory of the gospel is, is you're not gonna be good enough, but he's good enough. You can't do it yourself, so he gave you himself. You just need to get him on the inside and get born again and surrender all. Surrender all and give your life to him. So perfect peace comes from your mind being stayed upon him and comes from perfect love. So um, when I was thinking a lot about peace and thinking through my life and like what robs my peace the most, I am wired more of a, I need to understand. I am like more of an intellectual person when it comes to just thoroughly needing answers for things. And so I love this quote that says, you can't get the peace that passes all understanding until you give up the right to understand. Yeah, I know. And so, <laughs> on that note, I'm just going to explain kind of what that's done to me in my life. So, um, the last, I don't know, year and a half or so has been probably the most confusing, hard to understand. Well, numerous times, like, I, I of course, you want to understand, like, why didn't the Lord heal, heal our baby? Why did we have to go through a stillbirth? Why do we have to lose loved ones when we prayed so hard? Why um, do bad things happen? Like that, that constant wanting to know has lingered for the better part of my life until you finally get to a point of surrender and fully trusting that he is the good shepherd in Psalms 23 and he's leading us and that we can trust him and we do not have to have all of the answers. That is where you get true peace. That is where I finally found peace within is finally just saying, you know what? I don't know why these bad things happened. I don't know why he didn't answer my prayer this way, the way I liked it. I don't know why we're going through one hell of a year and a half for doing all the right things. I don't know, but I know what it's producing in me. I know that, that I'm getting closer to him and I'm becoming more like him. And that's really all there is to the Christian walk. I just summed it up, like trusting he is a good father and that no matter what the outcome is, no matter if your loved one does pass away too early, the end game is he loves us, he's with us, the, the, you have no control over it, you don't need to understand it, his ways and his thoughts are way higher than ours. We can't make sense of everything. And believe me, I'm preaching to myself. I wanna make sense of everything. Like for the first six months of this trial we're in, I was like, but I don't understand. How could someone do something? Like, how could someone logically, like, in what mindset does someone do something so awful? It's so foreign to me. I don't understand. I would tell him, I don't understand. Or why would God allow this? And why is God allowing this? And like, Lord, why haven't, you know, haven't we been through enough? We're doing all the right things. Like, why has it got to take so long be so hard and why we have no idea of the outcome. That's been my big, big um, saying of the century really is surrender the outcome. I've had to come to terms with surrendering the outcome of my life in general, of the outcome of my current situation, whether it ends up how I feel like it should, how I feel like it's the right way, whether your marriage ends up the way it should, whether your prayers answer, are answered the way they should be, we've got to give it up. Open hands. Lord, even if it doesn't happen the way I feel like it should, I still trust you that you're a good, good father. And that is where true peace comes from. And understanding the word. I keep coming back to the word. In this world, you're gonna have trouble. Friends are going to backstab you. Lovers are going to leave you. You're going to have breakups, heartaches, mess-ups, screw-ups, challenges, difficulties, economy, inflation, the elections, whatever. But we're not of this world. Yeah. Being not of this world is understanding there's an eternal outcome. Which is why fear of death goes away. That's right. So when I was struggling with the fear of death, that's gone because now I'm like, well, 
it's my time. I mean, I want to be here. Lord, if it's your will, I'm believing I'm supposed to be here, but I'm not going to sit here and fear that if I do, because worst case scenario is the best case scenario. So remember, in closing, the fruit of the Spirit is not something you manufacture. There's so many behavior modification self-help books out there. What you need is transformation. And only the Holy Spirit can transform you to become like him. And I'm just going to tell you guys, I'm bullheaded, hard-headed, stubborn, really screwed up, and really messed up when I go my own way, and I'm not abiding, and I don't have the Holy Spirit leading me. My, because I, there's always this conflict within. There's always this war. It's between the Spirit and the flesh. And the more that I sow to the Spirit, the more I reap from the Spirit. But the more I sow to the flesh, I reap from the sp- flesh. And I don't want to be sideways. I don't want to treat my wife because I got four little or a six little eyes watching. And not only do I have six little eyes in my home, there's a hundred plus kids that come to this church. Your children, your family, your eyes, right? And so I try to really be desperate and dependent by abiding in him always. I read a lot of my Bible I, I spend time in the Word a lot. I listen to worship and prayer a lot. My desire for TV and the things of this world just fades away. My desire for entertainment just fades away. Because I, don't, I, just, I want to be a man of one thing. And the more stuff God gives me, we've got new coffee shops and the, the growth of the church and the sanctuary and all the stuff happening, Majesty Outdoors and the land the more that this, the things start to really come to fruition, the more desperate and broken I want to be because I know I need to be because I know what I'm capable of doing without him. How about you? I'm looking at y'all. Am I the only one or am I being too vulnerable? Oh, you're the pastor. I should be perfect. You know the only area that God tells you to be perfect in? Pull it up, Matthew 5, 48, if you can. And we're, and we're gonna close with this and we'll have our prayer partners. We're gonna pray for you today. We wanna pray for you guys. Take this fast serious. When you lose your edge, you lose your fire. Go all in with the Lord and don't beat yourself up. It's not a legalistic thing. Yeah, like with the fast, I, I really wanna encourage us to make it our main priority to get to the root of why you have disrest. If you have any disrest, you're not peaceful, you wake up and there's some kind of turmoil or wrestle inside and then you you let other people experience the consequence of that, then I just really pray and encourage you to take this fast as a time for the Lord to search me. The Bible says, search me and know my ways. Find out any hidden parts of me, right? Any parts of- And cut it out. Yeah, and cut it out. Any anxious way inside of us. This is the best, most ideal time to get to the root of the issue. What is robbing your peace? The fast is a dedicated time to say, Lord, I'm ready to deal with it. I just want you to look at this scripture real quick. Do you know what the context of this scripture is? The context is love. The context is it's easy, like it'd be easier to say, man, I, it's easy for me to love my kids and love you and maybe in love y'all, but there's people out there that, that are really unlovable. And in this context, basically Jesus was saying, look, it's easy to love those that are easy to love, but what about the tax collector, which is the scourge of society? You know, look, even though I take a bold stand on this whole political thing, I still love every single person on either side or wherever they're at because God's for everyone. God's just as much for them as he is for us. So I want to love them well. I'm still going to take a stand because we can't call ourselves Christians and be passive. But I want you to understand, God calls you to love perfectly. So I want to love her perfectly as the Father in heaven is perfect. He's perfect. So our question should always be, how can I love better? When your spouse didn't do something that you liked or when your spouse did something that was really wrong, can you forgive them and love them like Jesus did? That's my question. The answer is yes, you can. That's the answer. You know, we've often said, I've told Amber this. If she has an affair, (laughs) 
I would forgive her. You know why I tell her that? Because I had an affair on Jesus. I was an adulterer. We've all played the harlot. All of us have. Whether it's something you looked at, something you did, you spent your affection and time on. Man, emotional talking about that. You know, unconditional love is I love you no matter what. Now, so that doesn't mean that it's okay to be abused. And, in the, and God gives you an out if a spouse has an affair. You know that? He, le- he gives you the out to divorce. And you guys know I've been married and divorced before. And my first wife had multiple affairs, and I forgave her multiple times. And then finally God said, okay, she's, not, she's never going to come back. She's going to continue to do that. And he released me out of it, and I divorced her. And then God brought me an amazing woman right here. And so I'm just going to challenge all of you. The answer is to always be spirit-led and to abide in his perfect love. Each one of you has a unique prophetic prescription. You know that? Each one of your situations, God has a unique prophetic prescription. Find out what it is. He's the great physician. He knows what you need. Sometimes something has to completely die before God can resurrect it. Did you know that? And some things just a person will never get resurrected because they'll make the choice to never come back. I'm still an optimist, but be spirit-led and don't walk in shame and don't allow anything but perfect love to live in your heart and where you have fear, doubt, worry, ask God to replace it with perfect love because God will take you to the edge again and again and again and again. I can't tell you everything going on in my personal life, but I'll say this before we pray. I'm constantly on the edge feeling like I may not make it in certain areas. And God always comes through. You can trust him because he's always been there. Trust is based on fact. Did you know that? It's different than faith. Trust is based on fact. He'll never leave you or forsake you, and he never has, and he never will. If you could just believe that, woo! All right, we're out of time. Sorry, I got all fired up there. Okay, let's all stand. I, I want to say one thing about that last thing I just said. You don't ever have the option to not forgive. Okay, that doesn't mean that it makes it okay what somebody did to you. Do you hear me? You hear me? I'm not saying it makes it... Forgiveness doesn't justify or make it okay. What it does is it releases them and releases you from becoming bitter and you suffering the pain of unforgiveness. Jesus, if he could forgive, you can forgive. All right? It also doesn't mean just because I forgave you that that made everything fine. All right? There's still times of restitution... And there's still an onus in a sense of other people to make the right choices, but you still have to forgive. And one of the biggest people you often have to forgive is yourself. And perfect love forgave you. Perfect love forgave you, all right? So here's what I'm gonna do. I wanna ask my prayer partners to come up, all of our ministry leaders to come up. Come on up, guys. We're gonna pray for you. Or we're we're gonna have them come so they can pray for you. And we're gonna pray for you publicly But if you'd like somebody to pray for you, if you're hurting, if you're confused, if you're lacking perfect love, if you have massive amounts of fear, if your marriage has been in disarray, if you're just really having a hard time in any area of your life, don't go it alone. Let us pray for you. You need help and God calls us to do it together. All right? So we'll pray and you can come up and let somebody pray for you as we pray or when we're done. Go ahead. Lord, we thank you so much for being with us today, for touching our hearts and speaking to us about how we can know your love more. Show us how to love you. Show us how to to know you so that we can know true love. 
Give us a desire, a burning desire to spend time with you so that we can know your nature, so that we know who you are and that we can naturally become like you. Help us to let go of any expectations, any outcomes that we've hang, we hang on to. Help us to just completely trust you as our good shepherd, that you're working all things together for good. Help us to remember that all we have to do is stay connected to you and make you our number one pursuit in life. Seeking your presence above all else and trusting that you will work it all the rest out in our lives. Lord, I thank you that your love covers a multitude of sins. Help us to love that way with other people. Please, Lord. We want to know your perfect love. We pray for a greater understanding and capacity to love the way you love. I thank you so much for this family. Even those that are hiding, hurting, angry, mad, or may not even like things here. Lord, I just pray for them, and I pray for peace, comfort, and strength over them. Those that are confused and angry, those that are, have had spouses go sideways, those that are struggling in their purity as singles. Lord, I just pray that you would invade their hearts and invade their space. And anybody here that's not born again, Lord, tug on their heart. And by the grace of God, call them into an intimate relationship with you. And I pray that they would all say yes. Those that have wandered away, Lord, I pray that you'd bring them back home. I pray that you'd invade our spaces, our homes, our bedrooms, our cars, our bathrooms. Everywhere we go, Lord, just pursue and never let us get away. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood. Thank you that all we have to do is rest and abide in who you are and who we are. I thank you so much, Lord, for transforming us to be like you. And I pray for this church that we would be a church of one thing, a church of intimate, passionate lovers, sold out, lovesick worshipers that desire you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. I pray for this fast and that you give us the grace through it. I pray, Lord, that this would be a great time of intimacy and revelation, wisdom, and knowing you more and becoming new wineskins, flexible and fluid to change and become like you. I love you, Lord, and I thank you so much for the fruits of the Spirit in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.